It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Comics.aadl.org. This is the show where we talk about making comics, uh, the lifestyle of the cartoonist, comics and education, comics in schools and libraries. And my name is Jersey Joe's cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today is, oh, returning to the show, actually, uh, is a uh, past guest, friend of the show, Stephen McCraney of malandchad.com. Hey, Stephen. Hey, thanks so much for having me back on today. Good to have you back. Uh, how You were in Japan not long ago, weren't you? I was. I think last time we recorded, I was actually living at my parents' house just before I was about to leave. And uh, so I went to Japan and was there for about six months. How'd you like it? It was awesome. I um, finished up uh, the third book in the Mal and Chad series, Belly Flop. And uh, while I was there, I bought so many... So much manga that I had to throw away clothes um, in my <laughs> luggage to get it all back home. <laughs> so I actually emptied stuff in order to fit it all. Well, so after was, all, what's great. more important, comics or underwear? Really? Let's. Yeah, uh, I mean, going to be serious. Seriously. About it. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I did fine with just one pair of underwear on my home. <laughs> so uh, maybe you, maybe you can have some manga recommendations for the uh, the tail end of the show today. Uh, because I want to dive straight into topic. Uh, so you do a book called Mal and Chad, and I have a copy of Food Fight right here, which we talked about in the show uh, last time and, and before. Uh, great comic. Do you want to give the elevator pitch for what Mal and Chad is? Yeah. Um, Mal and Chad is a um, story about a boy genius named Mal and his talking dog named Chad, and they go on all kinds of adventures together. And it's a funny book. It's uh, it's a kid lit, I guess. Uh, what, what would be the age group for this book? Uh, seven to twelve. Seven to twelve, and this is put out by Philomel Books, a division of or, oh, a division of Penguin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Penguin Young Readers. Okay, so here's where I'm going to preface this. I'm going to set this one up as we dive into the the talk about Skype visits. Uh, you're a published author. Mm -hmm. Job done. You did the book. It's been printed. Now you got to do is sit back and collect the money, right? Just all that crazy comics money starts coming in, and you know you just worry about drawing the next book, maybe if you feel like it, right? Yeah, I mean, you'd think that after all the hard work of trying to find an agent and pitching a book and actually writing a book, uh, which is a, an incredible hard thing unto itself, and you finally got through the whole process. You've um, Everything's actually everything's ready to go out to the bookstores, and uh, you kind of sit back and wait and realize that your publisher isn't actually going to help you promote your book, which is a new trend. I think it's the last 15 or 20 years in uh, publishing, but um, publishers these days are now more relying on an author to set up their own platform to promote their books instead of promoting the books for them. And I don't know, it's kind of it's kind of a shock uh, when you fi finally realize that it's up to you. Um, after all that work, it's time for more work. <laughs> right, right. But. Well, it's funny. I mean, i got to throw out a plug for one of my own things, uh, just to be crass. But this is actually related to what we're talking about. Uh, the Kids Comics Revolution podcast, uh, which I do with Dave Roman of yatime.com. Uh, we talked with Jared Krasowska uh, of Lunch Lady Comics. And, I mean, this guy, he works the streets hard. You know, he's beaten the, the, the streets to promote his book, do lots and lots of school visits. Um, and and, and when, I, when we were talking with him, it sounded like historically this is what a lot of the more successful authors do anyway, regardless of whether or not the publisher is standing behind them, is that a, a key to finding your audience is going out and seeking out that audience, right? Yeah, I think that's true. It's um, definitely not my first instinct because I've always – I mean, in order to get to the place of being an author, you're always asking the question – what makes a great work of art? And you're, ask, you're not as much asking, how do you get that work to the people? But the, both of them are very important uh, for being an author, I think. I, yeah, I think so. And I think that's something that we just have to uh, align ourselves with as, as authors is get used to also being salespeople as well as authors, right? And, and not, not in the uh, history. This is something I've been coming across a lot lately. I was listening to the Spark podcast, uh, cbc.ca slash spark, and there was a recent episode where they're talking about how the role of salesmanship is changing and there's all of this baggage about being a salesman. Uh, coming from like the the Willie Loman used car dealer uh, stereotype, but now uh, the, the the guest on the the most recent episode was saying that everybody's a salesman now, and the the key to being a good salesman is having a lot of passion for the thing that you're trying to actually 
give to somebody. So it's something that, that, that would actually make their lives better and, and you believe that it's going to make their lives better. Interesting listening for those who want to follow up later on more on the salesman kind of stuff. But so with that out of the way, so you do have to hit the streets. So you launched a Skype tour in October of 2012, right? Was that around the time you did it? That's right. Yeah, I'd just gotten back from Japan and I was trying to think how I could get the word out. And I remembered that um, while I was working on a belly flop, I, my parents would call uh, using Skype and I would just turn on Skype screen share and they would watch me work as we talked and they loved that. And I thought, gosh, if I could visit classrooms and actually do live drawing for them and then send them the drawings as a PDF afterwards, what it's almost like what difference is there then if I actually visited the school? I could almost make a near seamless simulation of me actually visiting um, without having to pay all the costs of, of traveling, which is the huge, huge inhibitor for me right now, just as an early author, just starting out. Sure, so. sure. I mean, like when you've, uh, when you've got your New York Times bestselling book, <laughs> you know, when you've got yeah. your Lunch Lady comics, then, then you can command some performance fees or some pretty big, uh, well, not big performance fees, but you can command, uh, you know, travel expenses and hotel fees and everything. But when you're just starting out, it might be a little bit tougher, right? Uh, so yeah, definitely. And I think that's why um, technology is such an ally for the early author because, honestly, um, even if, like for me, uh, going through Penguin, the advance that they pay me, um, it's a good chunk that I'm thankful for, but it really is only enough to cover basic living expenses, and it, it's not enough to you know launch a tour to visit all these schools around the, the U.S., so... Yeah, definitely making um, these new tools that have come available part of your, just an asset for yourself, I think is uh, one of the key tips to just, you know, putting yourself out there and, and making it, building a platform basically. But part of the theme that I wanted to, the, to pick at about this particular tour that you did, I mean, first of all, let's just throw this out. You started the tour with no strings attached. I was looking through the list of you know requirements in order to get a free a free Skype visit from Stephen McCraney, and you didn't even have to buy the book. There was even a section in there where you said like you know do I have to have, have read the book? And you said no, but if you do, you'll be my hero. You know I'll, I'll yeah. like you a lot for doing that. But uh, but that wasn't a requirement. So you put out this tour no strings attached. Everybody just come and get it right. Yeah, and that's like something that I really want to hammer in because you're right, everyone's a salesman nowadays, especially because we're all broadcasting our lives using social media. So people are constantly tuning in to us and like, you know, from the stuff that we put out there, um, everyone is, is getting an impression on us, so uh, an impression of us. And, uh, but the, the, mis the key mistake that you can take away and the mistake that I've made many times is I think, oh, I'm a salesman. Therefore, I need to go out and get my people to buy my product. But there's been a recent um, kind of realization that people are having that as soon as someone realizes you're trying to sell them something, they kind of bottle up. And um, it's kind of like uh, I had this realization. Um, actually, I'm a Christian, and in, in the Bible it says somewhere that uh, – uh, like we love God because he loved us first. And I think that's how it kind of works with everybody. Like you love your parents because they love, they loved you first. Like they loved you before you had done any, anything amazing. And I think that's how it works with human relationships. If you, um, give first, then you'll, then you'll get later, not because someone owes you something, but because you started a cycle of giving, you've been the first one to step forward and, and actually give something of value. And that's, that's hard to do because my first instinct is to, um, get on Skype and, you know, be like, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. <laughs> right. But what I found was if I just gave, 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 the opportunities to sell stuff actually popped up naturally and organically and preserved the relationship I wanted to build with these teachers. So I would get on Skype and teach the kids how to draw and they had a fun time and then I'd have a question and answer at the end. And at the end, the kids would always ask, like, where can we buy your books? Um, you know, uh, what's this book about? Tell us more about your work. And all I had to do was give first, and then the whole benefits that I was hoping to get from the tour just started coming out naturally, and I didn't have to step on anybody to get there. So I think you're right. No strings attached is a really important part of, of being a salesman. But that still doesn't take away the notion that you got to put on a good performance as well, right? So I'm wondering, 
you know, you we'll get into how you ap approach, you know, collecting prospects using salesman language or finding the educators and librarians. And then I want to talk a little bit about how things that educators and librarians can do to find the appropriate author for a visit. But um, how do you think about preparing for a Skype visit? Because, oh my gosh, that's a lot different. You don't get to walk around the room and look at every student's work. You don't get to use your body in the presentation as much when you're just a talking head on a screen. So are there any things that you discovered through the process of doing Skype visits uh, that, that changed the way you do author visits? Or was there something that you did on the front end thinking about like, okay, well, given that the limitations of the technology, here's what I need to do? Yeah, I think you're right. There's definitely a huge element of showmanship that really helps um, getting yourself out there. One of the things that I did, um, which I'm starting to try to implement more, <laughs> Uh, my first instinct is always like, oh, I know how to do this. But um, <laughs> I'm starting to realize whenever I want to learn something new, I need to ask for help. And so I started out before I had even put anything together by sending out, I, I found um, teachers I was already friends with on, on uh, Twitter and sent them all emails, showing them exactly what I wanted to do and asking them for feedback. So I got direct feedback and I actually met um, a wonderful uh, teacher named Colby Sharp who runs a blog called um, uh, Nerdy Book Club. Nerdy Book Club, yeah. Which is a wonderful uh, kids recommendation blog. And he gave me all kinds of advice um, as well as a bunch of other teachers on how to put this together and like what the needs of the teachers were so that I could kind of meet those needs and uh, you know, kind of build the tour for them before I even launched it. So, Colby Sharp is just Colby Sharp on Twitter. And yeah, he's a great guy to follow for this kind of thing. And he's a great, uh, uh, incredibly generous resource. Uh, mm -hmm. I love this. I love this idea of like a just asking for help too, you know? So, let's yeah, go. and the teachers actually, there's something about the fact that I actually implemented their advice. I wasn't just trying to get to them. Um, uh, I would actually take their suggestions and when they saw their suggestions incorporated into my design for the presentation, I think that meant something to them too. So cool. So um, have doing the school visits affected the, the book or your presence at all? I mean, here's like big thousand foot takeaways of like the tour is over, you did the big tour. Have you noticed any kind of like, is there anything different now upon doing uh, that? Hmm. I haven't. They uh, really only give you statistics for book sales every six months or so so I really haven't seen how belly flops doing I mean yeah. I try to look on the Amazon um, author page but it's really hard to get good feedback so yeah. I'm not quite sure I think it's doing it the first book did really well and I think it's doing as as well as the first book at this point well even but in terms of get direct uh, feedback I did notice a significant increase in um, uh, followers on Twitter and uh, just kind of teachers being interested in my book because a lot of their friends were talking about my book. So there were um, definite benefits, but um, it's, I don't know, it's very abstract, especially in the kids' market. I, I, yeah. I, I spent two months basically on Skype waking up and talking to teachers, and in the end I talked to over 2,000 kids. Wow. Um, but the tricky thing about kids is even though I talked to so many, most kids don't have Twitter, they don't have Facebook, so it's hard to get feedback from them. Um, I, yeah. I I assume that they, I mean, I did get some notes and some thank you notes from kids, and it seemed like they were really excited, but um, it's just hard to gauge because they're not really present on the social media yet. Oh, sure, sure. No, that that is something that uh, kid lit authors uh, face as a limitation is measurement, right? Um, yeah. And so when I was asking, I was, I, I was asking for that abstract kind of thing, like, did you notice any kind of uh, difference in your presence online, right? Uh, your presence and your conne your connections to people in those fields, because let's face it, those are connections now to, to again, to be very crass about it. Uh, you now have leads to follow up on, and these leads are very important because then they recommend you to other people. I did. I did a school visit uh, a few months back, and um, <clears throat> the I, you know, I I did like I always do. I just poured my level best into it, and uh, the teacher did a write up in the school newsletter about my visit and I, what you know with photos and you know what it meant to the kids and how much she enjoyed it and what the performance was like. And then boom, I get contacted by three other schools like within days. Right? You know, to we heard about you come teach at our place. So, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm wondering if, like, you had any kind of positive uptake on it. I imagine that you did, right? Yeah. In fact, um, toward the end, uh, I realized that um, Penguin actually has, is a partner of Skype in the classroom. 
And uh, so I was able, because I had kind of proven myself and shown that I can, I can visit and be consistent and uh, run a good tour, I was um, given the opportunity to join Skype on the classroom, um, which is a great website if there's any teachers out there. If there's any subject you want to learn about, you can go to Skype on, uh, uh, maybe I should, education.skype.com or something. I'll Eric, look that up. Eric Closer in the chat will look it up for us as well, and we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, it looks like education.skype.com. You, you go to the search bar, and you type in um, a subject that you're looking for, and it will come up with various different people who are willing to, uh, from around the world, who work in that field or teach that field. And uh, it, it's a really great resource that connects authors and teachers. Um, and so yeah. now I've uh, been featured as one of the authors on there, and um, this is going to be a continuing thing from here on out. I'll just visit a couple of classrooms a month. Oh, wow. That's great. Well, yeah. cool. So I'll have to look into that, too. <laughs> no, it's good, yeah. Uh, so, okay, uh, from, from you know, we talked a little bit about, like, how doing a Skype presentation is different than a physical presentation. So what, what walk us through, like, what exactly were you doing with these Skype visits? Like, uh, how long were they, and what was the activity that you were leading? Yeah, let me um, switch to Skype screen share, my new favorite tool, <laughs> and I will show you guys uh, exactly what I did. See yeah, you, you use this a lot, I would imagine, the Skype screen sharing. So did you, uh, did, can you see my screen? Yep, you can see it now. Awesome. Actually, I always started out by going, can you guys see my screen? And in the background happened to be my, uh, this is my cover for my book. <laughs> um, all right. So one thing I really want to show you guys real quick okay. that uh, helped. I actually, in order to pitch this whole thing, I drew a comic here and put it on my website. And basically, um, I, I had my, my character introduce uh, just the whole idea of the Skype visits. And then Mal and Chad pop up. And so it, it's a fun little comic that I drew. And they actually explain the whole concept so that teachers can actually see. I think comics are so powerful because it lets you see uh, what you're talking about. Um, and this it showed how great. I could do live drawings for the kids and then what I do at the end. And uh, Mal and Chad end up, oh, I end up commenting actually, hey, this sounds like a lot of work. How much are we going to charge for these visits? And Mal and Chad shout, nothing, <laughs> as if they've kind of <laughs> taken over the presentation and it, um, people better sign up quick. So now, now for those who listen to this, like this is released as an audio podcast as well. So just for their, their benefit, um, what we're looking at is it's a comic that you drew of yourself all, you know, Scott McCloud style, sort of introducing the teacher or educator or librarian to the concept of what a Skype visit even looks like. And I think this is great. You're, you're leveraging your ability as a cartoonist to say, look, I'm a cartoonist. I'm the real deal. But you're mm -hmm. also helping them pre-visualize what a Skype visit is. You know? Yeah, because a lot of teachers actually haven't really – Skype seems like a, a foreign thing and a very unsteady thing, too. It seems weird to talk over the Internet. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but – it can be really a stable and fun thing if you manage to get it to work. In fact, one time I tuned in, um, I connected to my class to teach that day, and I, I was on a stage. Um, wow. <laughs> they had actually projected me onto a stage in an auditorium, and uh, I was just amazed at the teacher who had the bravery to do a Skype visit that way. But there was a whole auditorium of kids, and it was like I was on stage, and I performed, and <laughs> it was nuts. It was crazy. <laughs> So that's cool. I, I think that that is, uh, well, we're also, uh, if we can pull it up on the screen, there's an FAQ that you follow after the, um, the comic where you address yeah, the FAQ these... is based off of um, all the questions that I asked teachers uh, about what the kind of questions they would have if they saw a presentation like this. So I was able to get a lot of good FAQs or, um, beforehand. And then this is what I really want to show you guys. So if you want to set up a sign-up form, um, I have this application or I, I put this application on my uh, site, and what I used for it was um, Google... Google Forms. they called Google Forms, yes. Google Forms. So my wife just the, introduced me to these, and this stuff is amazing. It's free. It's super easy to set up. It's what you see, yeah. what you get kind of editing, and you just put, create a bunch of forms, and then it, it, it populates in a Google spreadsheet for you, right? That's right. So I got this whole... The teacher can go here, press Submit, and then it pops up immediately in my form here. I, I uh, took out the name so there's no sensitive information here. But this is my spreadsheet that I went through. And it 
it allowed me to ask all the questions first because I knew there could be a billion emails where they're saying, well, what time do you want to do this? And what time do you want to do that? So I asked for their desired, their first choice of desired time, their second choice of desired time, and if they'd like a test call or not, um, what time zone they were in, all those kinds of things, any comments that they had. Um, so that's how I did that. And that was a really nice way to facilitate the whole thing. Especially if you don't have a personal assistant, right? I mean, you're doing this right. all by yourself. So, and, and yeah, the more questions you can ask up front to get uh, lined up, the better, right? Mm -hmm. so. so then I open up, for my presentation, I open up Manga Studio, which we featured on the last program, my favorite program in the world. <laughs> and I tell the kids that this is the program I use to make my comics with. And I have this two-page document in Manga Studio, um, which I have, let me get my palettes all reorganized here. Uh, I had this whole um, pre-designed presentation based off of um, just a simple comics page that I have. So I say, here's a simple way that I, I'm going to show you the two-step process that I used to draw my comics. And um, I start clicking on layers and turning things on so that they can actually see um, like my characters kind of come to life. I say, I start out with a sketchy, sketchy phase, add a little bit more detail on. And I show them the inking phase. Um, and then I turn off the pencils, and what's left is a nice, slick uh, Mal and Chad drawing. And then I, this is cool. So then I'll, I'll um, I looked up the name of their school, and I'll go, uh, let's see here, get the right font. I'll actually start customizing this form. So the, um, I'll be like, hi, Mrs. Uh, McCleary's class. Are you ready to learn and fill in the speech bubbles of these characters? So um, they're already getting exposed to Mal and Chad, but they're also getting like a really customized little worksheet that we're g going through. And they're watching comics come together live right in front of them at the same time. It's, yeah, this so is I a pretty layered approach. And yeah. Chad, um, also in one of my questions, I um, I asked for what their school mascot was, and so Chad always cheers on their school mascot. So like he might say, "Go Eagles" or something like that. Um, which is a really neat way because what right now this whole Skype thing, it, what they're really getting is a performance. I'm, um, and then when I see the F of this whole worksheet we worked on, it's kind of a memento of the experience that they get to hold on to. So this is the whole performing part right here. Um, and then just to show you the rest of my presentation, uh, I'll then ask them what, what they think comics are made out of. And we, we break down comics into the story and the pictures. And um, then what I have for them is the best piece of advice I could think of for how to tell a story and the best thing, piece of advice I could think of for how to draw pictures. And uh, um, I kind of base it so that if they're a, a kid who likes to write, they can benefit from the presentation. If they are an artist, they can benefit from learning how to draw pictures. Or if they want to draw comics, Learning storytelling and picture basics is, is really nice to know. So do you do any actual drawing, like them, uh, letting them watch you draw inside of these panels? Or is it, is it like what you got right now, just to, again, to describe this for the folks who are listening in the audio after the fact, is you've got a comic page up and you're kind of toggling layers to create sort of an interactive PowerPoint with a comics page, right? It's a much more richer experience than, than uh, what PowerPoint can or you know, Keynote can offer you. Uh, but I'm wondering if you're doing any like actual live drawing as well. Yeah, definitely. At this point, like I try to kind of rush through that first part um, mm -hmm. because from this point out is where I start the drawings. For the writing port portion, portion where I'm talking about how to make a story, um, I go through and I tell them my two basic questions that I always ask, which is what does a character want, what's preventing my character from getting what he or she wants. And together we make a character and I start, start asking them questions. What does this character want? Um, what's standing in their way and just by asking questions usually I'll pick a girl and uh, just draw a really simple like character I have them name the character and basically we tell a story together just um, just by their feedback like it maybe the character's name's Noel I'll put an N on her chest and these are really really super rough sketches but they they really love to see it happen in real time mm -hmm. maybe um, we decide that she wants to be the best hockey player in the world. The kids can come up with a lot of like really funny kind of stuff and uh, the obstacle that she encounters is she's afraid of ice and so I'll draw ice skates and all of her struggles with that and maybe there's like a monster, cookie monster who's the goalie 
like the, kid, <laughs> the kids will just come up with random stuff for their um, stories, but what they they start to see their story begin to form on the page, and then they also start to understand the concept of that I'm trying to teach them about how a character's wants interacts with the obstacles that they meet within a story. And what's great about this is this is what we call in uh, education diminishing risk, right? Uh, the language I use in my classrooms all the time is I'm handing over my drawing hand to your brain. So you don't even need to draw anything. All you got to do is throw ideas at me, and then together as a group, we're going to come up with a story. We're going to build this thing together so we can model this for you. So now I can set you guys off to doing it yourselves, right? That is cool. I love that. <laughs> diminishing <laughs> risk. So you eliminate all risks to make learning a lot easier? Yeah. Or is that? Yeah, so because like I, I did some teaching years ago in Detroit in some schools that where there was no art pro, uh, program whatsoever. Yeah. You're dealing with fifth graders who have never taken an art class, which is to me was astonishing, you know. But that's the state of some schools, and so we had kids who were terrified of drawing because they were worried about getting it wrong. Mm. And, you know, kids crying because they didn't want to put the pencil lines on the paper because they were scared of doing it incorrectly. And so that's where I was trained by some other teachers on, well, we, in that case, we diminish risk. We create low-risk activities where it's not about getting it right or wrong. You don't even have to actually draw. All you got to do is talk to me. And mm. they're being educated, and I'm slowly raising that risk level so that they will feel more engaged and want to take on the challenge of actually drawing the thing, right? I, I like that a lot. That's a great principle. So, uh, so this is cool. So you guys build a story together, and then what happens after this? Um, so I, then I go into the second part of drawing comics, which I say is the pictures. And I save that page, move on to the second one, and I give them my, the best tip I could think of for how to draw a picture, which is to use shapes. So then I ask them for what shapes they can think of, and we come up with a square, circle, and a triangle. And then here's like, here's like the real little clincher for my presentation, which I'm nervous to give away online because it's been such a um <laughs> well remember your principle of giving your principle kids, of giving you guys will be able to share this with them too <laughs> i start out by saying there's a lot of popular characters uh, cartoon characters that use these basic shapes circles squares and triangles so i'm going to draw a character now using just circles and you let me know when you recognize the character so this might be a little hard for us to um, for people who are listening to just the podcast but so you're drawing a circle and then upper right corner of the circle or upper right side of the circle you draw two more circles intersecting just the outer circumference and yes i see mickey mouse automatically so i just drew three circles and at the this point the kids are already shouting they're like mickey mouse mickey mouse right and um i'm like wait a minute i've only drawn three circles so far how do you know that that's actually mickey mouse and they of course they know and i then i complete the drawing of mickey mouse and um, then they're like, whoa, it's Mickey Mouse. It's magic. And, whoop. and then I, I finish up by saying, by just pointing out, basically I used just circles to draw Mickey Mouse. So circles for his head, his eyes, his nose. And then I point out, look, here's some half circles for his eyebrows, half circles for his cheek, half circles for his nose. So he's basically circles and half circles. And then I, I turn to the, well, turn to the kids. <laughs> um, <laughs> Figuratively speaking. Yeah, then I direct to the kids. I ask them, so if I asked you guys if you could draw a Mickey Mouse, you might think, no, nah, that's really hard. But if I asked you guys if you could draw a circle, everyone can draw a circle, right? And they get, they get really excited about that. Right. Um, then I go into the second one. We have the box. And, of course, um, I drew, like, this rectangle. And can you guess who the character this might be? Uh, I'm guessing he's going to make Krabby Patties pretty soon. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm like, well, SpongeBob, he's pretty easy to guess because he actually has the word square in his name. But what other shapes do we use besides a square to draw SpongeBob? And, and the kids shout start out some circles, shapes. circles, yeah, and then yeah, like squares for the T. So, so I basically go through and draw um, just a lot of these popular cartoon characters that the kids know um, and like, but break them down into their essential shapes. So it gives the kid a sense like, hey, I can draw those shapes. Like I know how to do that. Um, and then for the last one, which is the triangle, um, I start out, and they always guess, I start out with the t tip of the triangle, so they always guess um, Patrick, but then I switch uh, it up, turn it into a triangle, and... Uh, turn into Phineas. Turns into Phineas, yep. And I'm always like, Phineas is basically just a triangle with eyeballs. And they, get, <laughs> they laugh at that pretty, pretty much. So. so that's a little presentation on that. And then to finish up, I do a custom drawing for them, um, pencils and inks and everything for the, for the let. Um, for the last panel, and they get to decide whatever it is. 
Um, and then you demonstrate how these principles all converge in the final drawing that you do for the classroom. Mm -hmm. And now, while I'm drawing, um, I let them ask as many questions as they can fit in. And usually they can fit in quite a bit, um, as many questions as they have. Um, on my website here, I'm just going back real quick. Um, what I do once I'm done with that is then I have an image that I can actually, with the custom commission, I have an image that I can tweet out to people. And it kind of gets, turns into the secondary content. And I have a gallery here, and there is probably 80 or so images of just all these random drawings that the kids came up with. Here is a anime Batman. Um, <laughs> we have uh, here is Tinkerbell, Tinkerbell using an iPod or a, a iPhone. <laughs> oh wow! And this um, is based on the input from here. the classroom. Here's SpongeBob playing basketball. So they come up with so much random stuff, and it turns out really fun. Um, and I finish up, and uh, that's my basic presentation and how I do it. So once I'm done, you can go to File, Export, um, Image, and I just set the settings to export it as a single PDF. And then I use a, a, tra a file service called WeTransfer to send the teachers the PDF so they can just download it, and even if they have a slow connection. Um, if I send it through email, it might clog things up. But uh, I'll send it through this transfer service called WeTransfer. Okay. So WeTransfer. And that's about it. It sounds so easy. It's so easy, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I love about this is here's, here's another great thing, is that you are getting double duty out of the work that you're doing because these images that, first of all, okay, so the presentation is saved as a PDF. Now the teacher can take that, print it out for the classroom. The kids all have a take-home thing. What did you do in school today, Billy? Oh, well, we had this great cartoonist visit us who I'm just d crazy about, and I bet on that PDF it says someplace malinchad.com, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then it also concretizes what the learning experience was, which the teachers like. You've got a gallery where you're honoring this, the co collaborative work you're doing with the students, right? So, like, the kids mm -hmm. can go to the site and say, hey, there's a thing that the teacher or the, the, the artist and I did together. But then you've also got, hey, look, educators, look how many school visits I've done. Here's a record. And here's the fun stuff we make together. And you've got something to throw into the news cycle to say, hey, I'm still doing this thing. I, here's, here's my relevance to this field. And here's the latest bit that I created for that, right? That's right. It's all feeding back into itself. And it's all very organic. And it's a lot more natural way of doing things than going to a school saying, hey, I want to sell a bunch of copies of my book. Let me in and have access to your kid. Because, <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, it's a really tender Yeah. <laughs> um, it's an honor to have a teacher allow you to talk to their kids because they're trusting you not to <laughs> just be a walking advertisement, but to actually give something of value. And so if, if you're just giving, 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 you're right, it, it kind of starts to turn back to you in, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, so it gives, gives you a lot of different resources that um, normally you wouldn't have. I, I think that's great. And you, you have other educational downloads on the Mal and Chad website as well. Like you have uh, how to draw Mal and Chad files that people can download using their classrooms. And this is where we get to going back to the Google form that you set up. And it is absurdly easy to set up a Google form. So that's like for anybody who's wondering, like, how do I do this? Just go into drive.google.com and you'll see that there's a form builder in there that you can use. Um, but uh, Creating some materials to familiarize the prospective teacher and the classroom with your work is if they don't have the book, right? What else can you give them? And like a little PDF with, you know, how to draw the characters or some kind of interactive activity on there. Uh, I saw also on the website that you had some things uh, fill in the word balloons for the characters. That was part of a different uh, contest that you were uh, participating in or, or running on the site, right? Mm -hmm. I used to um, do a, uh, a contest um, on a website called Neatorama where I would send images of my characters and people could guess what they um, guess what the characters were saying mm -hmm. and whoever did the best submission uh, would get a prize but they're they're kind of nice right now because kids can print them out and kind of do their own Mal and Chad comics by filling in the speech bubbles so it's yeah it's it's a nice inexpensive way for you to provide resources for the uh, venue to familiarize themselves with your work, especially when you're an, you know an author just starting out. Now I want to back up and talk about a logistical thing. So you said, let, let me just I'm I'm going to assume this is how it happened, uh, Stephen. Is you said 
free skate visits on your website. And then just everybody just started just lining up automatically, right? You didn't have to do any kind of outreach. You didn't have to do any kind of uh, searching for uh, places to spread the word about this. All you do is just put a link on Twitter and then magically people signed up for your classes, right? I well, I'm pretty sure that's how the internet works, right? <laughs> I mean, you just put stuff there. <laughs> yeah, you just put stuff, and then then no, the I really couldn't comes. have done as half a. I, I couldn't really have done as well as I did without um, just the help of the people I reached out to in the beginning, um, which is so key. Finding people who can get behind what you're trying to do um, for their community and uh, getting the support of them. So what really clinched it for me was. Um, uh, Colby Sharp offered to promote the tour on the the um, uh, the Nerdy Book Club blog, and I realized that I didn't want him to just put a link there. I wanted to have the full form and everything. So I I reformatted the comic and I even redrew the comic a little bit so that he could put it on his blog and teachers would just read the comic and then go straight into the sign-up process and they wouldn't even have to go to my website. Oh, that's smart. Um, so I, like, I just kind of customized everything so that he could just put it as a blog entry on his website. Right. You want, you want that, um, the impulse buy, as it were. Yeah. It's like if you can minimize the amount of steps someone has to take before they you know, sign up or whatever, that's kind of the key. I didn't even want them to have to click to go to my website. I wanted to just be there, be present on the website. Now, did you did you have a deadline on this? Uh, a deadline for signups? I did at first. It was. Uh, it doesn't matter if there. What we don't need to know the exact date, but I'm just curious if if a deadline came into play. Yeah, I did have a um, a deadline for signups after a month or so. After I got to the point where I felt like this is what I'm I'm about maxed out for till the end of the year. Okay. Um, so then I kind of closed the gate. Okay, so you didn't you didn't necessarily start out with that, is what I'm okay because oh, yeah because that's, I had to oh and that's another I didn't show it very well but um if you put underneath your comic or whatever kind of sales pitch you have for the uh, um, for the tours I put a little thing that says um, Skype tours are currently and then uh, I can update it to say open or open until March or um, closed because I am too busy, that kind of thing. Uh, it's a nice way to be able to just update it depending on what, what you're doing. We highlighted reaching out to educators online, and there are some out there that are, are reachable, like Colby Sharp, John Shu, um, and then also uh, the Kidlet. There's Kidlet circles. I mean, there's like a Kidlet uh, discussion hashtag on Twitter that people get involved with. I think I've seen you in some of those discussions before, Stephen, right? Mm hmm. Um, so that's that's the way to start finding the 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 people to talk about your Skype visits. Uh, takeaways. Uh, any advice you'd give to somebody? Like, there's a cartoonist out there who's got a book, and they're like, "Gosh, that sounds like an amazing idea." What would be a, after doing a whirlwind tour like you just did? What would be a, a piece of advice that you'd throw at them? What was the thing that you learned from doing this thing? Hmm. <laughs> Um, I think the two obvious ones I've already mentioned is um, ask for help mm -hmm. and um, put the put put their needs before your needs. Um, there's the like you said that you mentioned there's like the how to draw Mal and Chad PDFs on my website. Those are only there because some kids asked for them and I hadn't even thought about it. Um, but I listened to the kids who were on the tour and then I emailed the teacher afterwards and said, hey, I, I listened to what your kids had to say and so I put these up online. So listening to the needs of the people you're trying to reach um, and putting their needs before yours uh, is the key one. Um, uh, maybe a less important thing would be to um, when Skype hiccups, when <laughs> Skype fails you, um, and it will to let it go. <laughs> I, I had uh, many. I had a teacher that um, I was all ready to go. I had even managed to, to text her. Uh, beforehand, and I was like, "Are you guys ready?" And I couldn't make Skype work for some reason, and it was so frustrating to know that there was a classroom full of kids waiting for me, yeah. and I couldn't manage. I like I couldn't reach them, and I had to reschedule. But they were okay with it. Um, I made it clear in the entry form that those things happen, and when a teacher wasn't able to reach me, we rescheduled. And when I wasn't able to reach a, a teacher, in fact, sometimes teachers would. Um, Call me and say that they, or email me and say that they couldn't actually use Skype because their 
um, district had signed a, an, an exclusive agreement with Adobe or something. Oh, um, no. So they had to use a special type of software that Adobe was using. Adobe Connect. So I had to actually switch yeah. software and download different things in programs in order to reach them. But um, yeah, I was willing to do that because it's the people that matter, not the program. So the, the software is just a tool. Yeah. And uh, you can just let it fail when it needs to. <laughs> and and it is a single point of failure kind of thing where once it goes, it's just it's broke. You can't do it. So yeah, I was gonna ask like if he did like any kind of backup things, like like, oh here's our backup plan. If Skype fails, will we try like well the show is streamed over Google Hangouts on air, right? So it's like I, I think about like if I were to do this, I would say, here's Skype and this is my Skype handle and everything. But if that fails, you can reach me on Google Plus. We could do a Google Plus hangout instead. Uh, yeah, I was hoping I was um, ready with that kind of thing too. It's it's tricky because there's a, that type of solution only applies to certain types of problems. Like if the internet's not working, or yeah, um, there's there's many different so many different types of problems to hang things up, no matter what plans you make. I'll call you on the telephone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a speakerphone conference and I'll describe <laughs> what I'm drawing. Yeah, yeah. In those cases, then it's just it's it's all you can do is reschedule, right? I mean, there's nothing you could do about that, so. But, uh, okay, well, we're coming up on, uh, actually, is Aaron's not here yet? Okay, so we won't go into book recommendations just yet. Uh, and I want to encourage people in the, the YouTube comments, if you have any questions, to throw at Stephen. Now is your chance. We can open up some Q&A. Uh, Jeanette Tigner is saying in here, I wish Skype was around when I was in elementary school. This would have been awesome. No kidding. Right? Imagine that. We would have, like, when we were kids, Stephen, it was like they roll in the TV with the VCR, or going back even a little bit earlier to my elementary school days, the old film strip with the. Projector, yeah. <laughs> with, like, the tape deck that played the beep, and then, like, the AV kid would have to turn the spool on the, on the projector. But actually yeah. having a Skype author visit, that sounds pretty darn amazing if you think about it's, it. It's really amazing because, like, I would. Um end up in a classroom and ask them, where are we right now? Where am I? <laughs> and they would tell me that I was in a very small town in Canada somewhere. <laughs> and the idea that like a, a school like that wouldn't, an author would never travel to an obscure town somewhere in the mountains of, of Canada, uh, you know, the, the Rocky Mountains or wherever um, yeah. they were located. But um, with Skype, we were able to connect even though, like even though they're a very small school and a small demographic, the kids were still there, and I was still there, and um, Skype let us connect in that way. So it's a re it's really neat. It's really cool. Well, and that, that's the other thing too that I would throw out for educators who are in like a uh, more rural or remote district, where they're saying like, "Well, gee, you know, I I'd love to have you know like I I grew up in a very rural area. I think there were twenty five kids in my class. You know, little house in the prairie kind of stuff." And so we'd get like one visit a year from somebody and they'd always do assembly style because they wanted to maximize the return on that, understandably so. Uh, but When I was a kid, we actually took a field trip to the um, sewage treatment facility. <laughs> and looking back on that, I was like, I had no idea why we were doing that, but I'm sure they got a really cheap deal to bring a bunch of kids to the, uh, <laughs> the sewer center, but bleh, it's not fun. I'm sure. Well, what grade was this? Uh, probably third or fourth or something. Okay. Well, see, that's the age where you're really in the gross-out humor, though. So I imagine yeah, that there was a couple of kids who were probably <laughs> delighted by that experience. Uh, it's like garbage pail kids come to life. <laughs> um, so, did you get any special equipment to do this? I mean, I see that you're talking on a USB headset. Um, mm -hmm. Anything else that you did differently in terms of your setup after doing these Skype? Is it like equipment purchasing that anybody should be worried about? Yeah, headset. Um, is important because the microphone that is in a camera and, or in your computer usually isn't uh, a good enough sound quality. It's nice to have the little spit protector and all those yeah. things. So a headset's good. I bought a new camera because it turned out what was causing Skype to crash was my old, old camera. Oh. Um, and it has they're, they're getting pretty good these days where you can buy a decent camera for maybe $30 to $60 uh, that will let your picture show up really nice. And then, of course, um, I use a Cintiq but I'm sure you could do a simple Wacom tablet if you wanted to do live drawing for the kids. Yeah, I've done that before. So, yeah, you could do that with just like an Intuos uh, mm -hmm. and just do screen sharing. Uh, also, investing in some decent internet service probably helps it's true. too. You know, it's, yeah, it was really hard when uh, I'd contact teachers and the school they were at didn't have the best um, services. So, 
In this, it's nice that it's on my. It, it, if I can help anyway on my end to have a good internet, then it it helps things even more. Right, right. I mean, like you can't do anything about the school's internet connection. You 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 get what you get with that. But if you can, you know, at least eliminate that point of failure as well by investing in some decent bro uh, broadband bandwidth to make sure that you can pump out a good signal at the very least. Uh, Scott King is asking in the the YouTube comments, when is Mal and Chad book four being announced? So that's the trick. Um, there is currently no plans to make uh, a Mal and Chad book four, which kind of has brought me into this season in my life where I have to wrestle with the reality of an author. But my publisher is standing, stepping back and seeing, is this book going to sell? And if it if it takes off, then there'll be more books. And if it doesn't, um, then I'm going to have to kind of reinvent myself and come out with some all new work, uh, which is really exciting, but also kind of like nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah. Before, but um, I will bet. I will bet because uh, especially how, three books. You know, you've been living with these characters for some time. Uh, do you have ideas on what you would do if you were to reinvent yourself? Um, I'm de I'm definitely gonna stay in uh, kids, um, uh, kid lit kind of world because I feel like there's such a good uh, there's so much freedom here like the the more adult kind of comics um, you get into more superhero kinds of stuff but the most creative stories I see happening in the comics market right now are definitely in the kid lit place and so I am working on some uh, a mini treatment right now for a new story um, which I don't know how far it'll get but um, I'll probably stay in that area oh and then I have this project I'm working on, um, these comic essays about uh, how creativity works and how, what, it's, what it's like being a creator. And I don't even know how to market that really because uh, it's something that I, I'm not, I don't know, it just kind of came out of me. It's a nonfiction kind of how-to comic book thing. You've been uh, posting some of these online, right? I, I'm not sure what to do with that. <laughs> but, yeah. some, some of these you've actually posted on your website, yes? I, I, I recall yeah, seeing some um, of these. Yeah, doodlealley.com. What is it again? It's where you can read the first 100 pages of this book I'm working on, which describes what it's like to journey from an aspiring artist to mastery. Not that I'm a master, but just some of the things that I've learned about how you make creativity sustainable. So run that URL by us one more time for the folks who are just listening. Um, so it's Doodle Alley. Doodle uh, Alley. Like a street name or something. Awesome. So 100 pages are already up. So cool. Well, okay, I want to give you the final word on the Skype visit thing. Any final thoughts, things that we didn't touch on because we're about to kick into book recommendations? Um, yeah, I mean, besides the main message of put other people's needs before your own, just a quick tip, which I learned here on uh, Comics Are Great. If you are um, streaming to a classroom uh, and doing the live screen share with your drawings and stuff, if you turn your screen um, into a uh, down to a really low resolution, it's going to feel weird. Everything will feel big and bulky, but it's going to let the stream go a lot faster. So that's just a tip. And it's going to look better on the other end, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, hey, there we go. A tip picked up on the <laughs> Comics Are Great show. Uh, jack down your screen resolution. I want to throw one more thing on this while we're on this topic. Uh, Dave Roman, yaytime.com. If you go to yatime.com slash blog or just hit the blog uh, link on his website, it's actually yatime.com slash blog slash back to school with some dashes between the words. He's doing a Skype visit uh, contest where, let's see, it's on uh, the first 15 teachers or librarians to email him with a complete mailing address will be sent 30 free Astronaut Academy bookmarks. And then there's a Skype contest to sign up for a 20-minute Skype visit from, from Dave Roman himself uh, in the lead up to uh, Astronaut Academy re-entry. That's cool. Bookmarks, so, way to show me up. <laughs> <laughs> They're cool bookmarks, too. So, yeah, th there's another tip. You know, it's like uh, bookmarks. I would also throw in uh, Ryan Estrada of ryanestrada.com did something really cool with bookmarks where he turned them into uh, mini comics where he printed double sided. And, it, and if you just fold it, it's a, both a bookmark, but it's also a four page mini comic, which I think is a great idea. And you can get them for like 20 cents a pop from a lot of these different online printers. So. That's another okay. one. <laughs> so, yeah, so everybody should go to uh, any educators or librarians watching should go to yaytime.com to take advantage of Dave's, Dave Roman's Skype visit contest. And with that, I will turn to Aaron Helmrich, who is in studio. Aaron Helmrich of comics.aadl.org. Good to see Hello. you again. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's January.
the light is coming back after the longest day of the year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. So you it's, get through winter. It's, it's, it's daylight all the way until like 4.30 now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what's going on? Anything, anything new going on at, at the, the Ann Arbor District Library? Um, well, believe it or not, we're getting ready and talking about summer game stuff already. So oh my planning gosh. far in advance. So it's the beginning of the year, but yeah, I'm starting to think about the warm months already well, and what play we're going to be doing. Play.aadl.org is a big deal yeah, now. Yeah. I mean, is this is the third year it's going to be Yeah, going? it'll be the third year. And so each time we have to have a little more lead because we make it that much more complicated and oh, wow. and fun. So Yeah. So cool. Yeah. So uh, so you, it, we're in book recommendation time yes. now. So, Stephen, I didn't. I, I don't know if I, I prepped you on this. If you have any books that you wanted to recommend uh, coming up, but we're going to let Aaron go first. And then if you have any that you want to throw out, uh, I wanted to, to recommend Mal and Chad, first of all, which is yes. in the library's collection. It yeah? is in our collection, yes. So there we go. You can get it at the Ann Arbor District Library today, Food Fight by Absolutely. Stephen McCraney. Yeah, we've got that. I think we've got five copies, so every location has one. Oh, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> so, definitely. So there we go. And you can check out some of the art. I'll put it up on the Comic Cam, or Matt will at any rate. And we saw some of Steven's art earlier as he was doing the live drawing. But yeah, it's a really, really fun comic. Uh, so yes, definitely. Uh, you can get it at malinchad.com or at the Ann Arbor District Library. Check what out. else? What else? All you got? right. So I wanted to start with um, a lot of people don't know that with everything that's going on with ebooks, one of the things that makes Ann Arbor District Library great is we've actually started licen licensing material directly. So this book, Poopy Claws, which is by the <laughs> Ambombs, who do the library comic um, Unshelved, um, we have licensed this book directly. So if our patrons, it's our cardholders, go onto our website, they can actually download this and have it. But Whoa. we also have some hard copies. Um, and anyone, well, you said download and have it. You mean I got to go to Overdrive? No. And I have to check it out, no. quote unquote, and then it expires after a little. Absolutely little. not. That's what? what makes this so awesome. We actually are. Um, we have a committee now, and we're working directly with creators and making the deals directly. You know, for a set time, and for you know, complete ownership. So it's none of this borrowing an e, you know, a digital thing that disappears and then you don't have it anymore. So our patrons, so it's just our card holders. Sure. Um, that would be able to download and have it. Is this something that you're going to branch out to doing with more books? Absolutely. Oh yes. my gosh, that's so exciting! Are so, you listening, Audra Ferrici of NemuNemu.com? Yeah. Uh, we're going to get you guys talking with the Ann Arbor District Absolutely. Library because I think that'd and be I really think, cool. Um, I'm not positive, but this one was like a four-year deal, so we have it for four years, and then, you know, I mean, with like anything, you know, we all know with your print material. Four years is still a pretty decent amount of time in terms of selling. So yeah, yeah. So this was awesome. I mean, um, Eli has a good relationship with the creator here, and that's sort of how that started. But yes, keep your eyes peeled for more of it. That's uh, for sure. So um, exciting. And Poopy Claws, it's in hard copy too. Um, okay. Awesome. So, so start from the top about Poopy Claws. About so you know, basically, the book. Um, Poopy Claws is about a cat who doesn't like to use his box and the trials and tribulations of, of that for his owners, and a particularly um, ill-mannered house guest that comes over that finally sends it all over the edge. Although, I have to say, anybody that has kids and you know enjoys poop will absolutely love the story. <laughs> But if you just yeah, have cats it. too, yeah. you'll, enjoy, you'll enjoy it as well. I like. I have kids. I enjoy poop. Yes. I feel very lucky, though. I've never. I've had fairly fastidious cats. I've never encountered a cat that had problems like this. So mm. I feel grateful. Um, our next one. I just wanted to show real quick. This is awesome. If nobody knows about it yet, um, it's an actual graphic novel cookbook called mm. Dirt Candy, put out by this um, vegetarian restaurant in New York City. And so it actually has recipes and the like, but then it also has illustrations telling a story and telling you how to, to do some of the stuff that you're doing. So it's instructional, but it also provides context. Absolutely. So I'm a huge fan of the Oishinbo manga that, mm -hmm. um, you know, covers a different kind of Japanese food in every volume. So this is definitely for folks who like that kind of stuff. Um, but who someone something a little bit more fun than just your basic... Um, so book. it's like Good Eats as a comic. Ex absolutely, yeah. Yeah, like in yeah. format, if not in total content. Yeah. And I and we've got I think five copies on order, and there's a few holds on it already. I've been reading about that. Ah. And then this one I'm really excited about. I'm I'm gonna say the now of Brown. I'm not sure how else to pronounce that. Um, but it's an interesting 
story about a girl who has OCD, but not in the typical um, sense of um, physical, external repetitive patterns. It's more mental obsessions. Mm. And what makes it even, the character works in a vinyl toy shop, like at Vault of Midnight, you know, if they had comics, mm. um, in London, and is also working on her own illustration career. So there's also a oh. story in the story um, of the book that the character is writing as well. Um, it's pretty cool. But, you know, oh, I love been, that watercolor style or the gouache a, it's style. It's a beautiful style. And, um, you know, I was sort of thinking with um, Ellen Forney's Marbles, you know, with the mental illness. I'm um, talking about bipolar. This is sort of an interesting, this is OCD. So I think you get a real interesting insight into what it's like to live with that, um, especially because it's not the typical, you know, you have to touch a doorknob over and over. It's more mental for this, for this character. So. Um, mm -hmm. We've got several copies on order, and that's got a couple holds on it. I think that one's going to be really popular. And then this, I just brought this because it has the most holds on it right now of anything new, and I'm trying to figure out why. Do you know, have any insight? It's it's part of the new 52. It's yeah, Batgirl, Bat so. Gail Simone. Yeah. yeah, very, very, very popular yeah, character so. and title and at writer. Moment. Okay. So, yeah. so at the moment, it's one of the hottest things that we've got on order. Yeah, it yeah. Should be arriving soon. Well, Gail Simone is is a celebrated writer. She writes great characters. She writes great superheroes. And there was also uh, some dust up recently about Gail Simone's status at DC. There was uh -huh. like some some drama around her okay. getting fired and then rehired. That may have something to do with it. But also, I understand. I haven't read it myself, but I understand that the Batgirl series that she was writing was mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. So, so there's another one. So yeah, and it, it, the list is still up at. Uh, wh wh where should people go to see what's hot at ADL? If you go to um, ADL and you click on our catalog link. Um, right below that box, when you bring it up, it'll bring up new graphic novels, and that's a great place just to see what's on order, and you can place holds. You are know, you still as doing the, are coming in. the what's hot list though too? Yes, and then there's the what hot list right next to it. They're both okay. in the same spot. So this is a tool that I would imagine would be of interest to other cartoonists and publishers and people in the comics industry is to look at this because, you know, this is, libraries are a place where a lot of comics yeah. are getting read now, and if you got this list that's showing like here's what's popular at mm -hmm. our place, you could get a sense of what's going on, keep your finger on the pulse of well, what's going on. Well, especially I like to monitor the new list because it's like okay, I just ordered however many copies, and there's already. 27 holes mm -hmm. so it gives me an idea of you know if i need to buy more but mm -hmm. it also just gives you an idea of what people are looking for and cool. what they're interested in awesome well, those are all great book recommendations Aaron. thank you uh steven i wanted to give you a chance to throw out any th of yours and then i've got a couple of my own um i'm sure it's already been on the show but um secret science alliance by eleanor uh da davis yes is amazing you got um all of the iconography that you find in like a, a Chris Ware book with all the labels and <laughs> arrows and cu cross cutaway views, but like all the excitement and color and action of a of a kid's comic book. So I totally recommend wow. uh, Secret Science Alliance. I don't know if that one has been mentioned or not. Had we it? have that at the library. Oh. So. <laughs> it is great. And that's a good thing. And then um, also, uh, I just got back from Japan, and one of the com most uh, we were talking about earlier how I had to bring home. I brought home so many comics I had to throw away clothes out of my luggage, but <laughs> one of the comic books that kicked out clothes from my luggage was um, this series uh, um, that's super popular in Japan um, called Doraemon, and uh, this is Doraemon right here. It's this kid series. It's never been translated into English because it's very um, Japanese in character, and there's a lot of stuff that's kind of unique to Japanese culture in it, um, but... It inspires me so much. Um, this is a story about how they find a world uh, floating in the clouds, and they go back in time, and dinosaurs, and there's robots, and pretty much everything that's great about a kid's story. Um, and it, is, it, it has inspired Mal and Chad significantly, um, just mm. the whole adventuring, invention kind of aspects. The basic premise, it's about a robotic cat, cat who comes from the future. Um, <laughs> he has lost his ears because ma um, some mice ate the ears, ate his ears in a factory. Um, he has this magical pocket that contains inventions from the future, um, which the uh, little boy that he helps out throughout the story um, is always calling on him to pull out some kind of incredible invention. So very similar to Mal and Chad in that regard, and I, I kind of owe a lot to this series. Wow. What is it? How do you spell uh, Doraemon? Uh, D-O-R-A-E-M-O-N. So it's like Doraemon. So Doraemon. Doraemon. But, yeah. Okay. Well, cool. Well, we'll have to put a link to it. Uh, Eric, are you going to be able to find a link to that? <laughs> <laughs> Eric already got it. He gave me the thumbs up. Oh, uh, well, he is good. He is a miracle worker. EJK on the Twitter. So the man is a mensch all the way around. 
Uh, I want to throw out a... I mentioned Dave Roman before. Here's where I'm going to do it again. Uh, Astronaut Academy reentry is serializing online uh, on astronautacademy.com. Uh, the first second is doing some really cool stuff by allowing their authors to serialize the graphic novel on, a web, on the web before it comes out in print. Now, I imagine when the book comes out, uh, I think it comes out this spring... The archives are going to be taken down except for a, a preview. So this is your chance to read the book, to preview the entire book before it hits stores at astronautacademy.com. I love this book. I've said in other places many times. Uh, the thing I love about Dave's writing is he knows how to write for kids as if he's there with the kids. He is a fellow kid just saying, isn't this awesome? Uh, and uh, none of that affected kind of gather around children as I prepare to regale you with a storytelling tale. You know, <laughs> it's 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 just, he talks like a kid, you know, or thinks like a kid. So it's it's a great series uh, if you're a fan of uh, video games, pop culture, that all the pop culture we grew up from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, I can't see why you wouldn't enjoy this book. It, it has uh, giant guard teddy bears who shoot fire out of their feet. Uh, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> and then also, you mentioned uh, the, the the recipe book. What was it called again? It was called um, Dirty Candy. Dirty Candy. I also yeah. wanted to throw out another uh, plug for a web comic. Cooking Up Comics is another recipe comic series that you can find online. Uh, that that's a great one too. It's, if you're a vegetarian like me yeah. and looking for uh, cool ideas, and and I just love the idea of nonfiction comics as well. So, CookingUpComics.com. Two web comics recommendations this time from me. So, we got to wrap this up, guys. So, uh, thank you, Stephen, for all of the great insight today. I mean, people are already talking about this episode on Twitter while we're doing it. You know, lots of great ideas. Uh, Josh Elves gave us a pat on the back. Audrey Ferrici is there watching, giving us a pat on the back, saying uh, lots of great food for thought for doing school visits. Thank you for continuing with this spirit of giving, Stephen. Hey, uh, it's a pleasure to be on the show today. Thanks for having me. And then, Aaron, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for keeping such an awesome collection available for the people of Ann Arbor. My pleasure. <laughs> We're you... at the middle point, so I'm spending lots of money <laughs> to catch up. So our local <laughs> listeners, uh, come on down and, and start putting some holds on items. Yeah, that's right. And then, uh, yeah, you're the selector. for You're the, the go-to person. I for, am. So, so if somebody says, like, And hey, I take all patron suggestions. So if you feel like you're, there's something there that, that you do, haven't seen, let me know. So cool. So, and that's at uh, aadl.org is yes. the way to get in touch mm -hmm. with you. So, okay. Well, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, everybody, for downloading and listening. The show will be archived at comicsagreat.com slash CAG70. Thank you to Matt Dubay and the guys in the production room for putting this episode together. Matt's rolling his eyes because we had technical difficulties throughout this one. Uh, it, it's always an adventure uh, doing the show with you, Matt, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, we get to <laughs> grow old together prematurely. <laughs> Uh, so uh, thanks again, everybody, for downloading and listening. If you want to help out the show, you can give us a thumbs up on the, the YouTube video, or you can give us a star review on iTunes. That would be a great way to let peop more people find this show. And until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsGreat.com and Jersey on the Twitters. Okay, bye.